and it being just after 5 p.m., we will now move to a first speech. Pursuant to order, I now call Senator Cox to make her first speech and ask honourable senators that the usual courtesies be extended to her. I call Senator Cox. Wooler, Mr. President. Nyang Kwel Dorinda Cox. Nyang Murich Nunga Bibbulmun Yamaji Yoga. Rear Nyang Kura Bridia Yoga. Mort Yang Nija Yak. Nyang Mort Kanyang Yuat Amangu Ware Wajiri. Southwest Rear Midwest Gascoigne, Western Australia, Buja. Nyang Maya Maya Wajak Buja. Buru. Nyang Karich Nija Buja Nariang Barang Ni Nyang Kanan Kalkul Nanawo Ware Nambri Buja Rare Nyang Wank Kaya Nyang Mort Kura Bridia Mort Yen Bridia Mort Rear Yira Hurling Bridia Mort Benang Borda Bridia Mort Nyala Kala Kurl Jong Jong Yak Nija Buja Nyang Morn Mort Buja Kedalak Ye Yua Bim Bu Yitang Yang Rear Nyang Mort. I thank you, Mr. President. My name is Dorinda Cox, and I am a strong Nyunga Bibu woman, Yamaji woman, and I come from a long line of powerful matriarchs. I belong to the clans of the Kanyang, Yuat, Amangu, and Wadjuri peoples of the southwest and midwest regions of Western Australia. I acknowledge and pay my respects to the stolen lands we meet today and belong to the Ngunnawal and Nyambari people of this area. I pay my respects to their elders past and present and their emerging leaders who we nurture, love and support for the future generations who will continue our legacies. Sovereignty of this country remains although there are no treaties with the First Peoples of this country. I start this speech today in the Nyungar language, the ancient mother tongue of my Nyungar Bibbulmun people where I live, work and raise my children. I call Burulu, Perth, my home. The two dingo dreaming tracks are where I grew up as a child, in Waliala, which is also known as Fremantle. I want to acknowledge my mother Margaret, my brother Michael, my daughters Ailish and Kira, and the rest of my family and friends who are not joining us here in the chamber today due to the COVID restrictions of quarantine, but are instead watching us online. Firstly, it's not the same providing this important and momentous speech without having you all here with me. But I can feel the love, support and energy that you are sending from afar today, and I'm comforted knowing that you are here with me in spirit. I'm well aware that these sacrifices I will be making starting today and in the future serving as a senator for WA will and do matter to you personally, and that through my work we will be able to see the impact of what it, it will have on the lives of so many. Thank you for generously allowing me to do this with your blessing, and more than ever, I want you to know that this is possible because of you, and this is your legacy too. I've travelled from my home state, the fifth strong Greens woman from the West, <laughs> and I thank those who have welcomed me to this country today, Billy, Leah, Paul, Janara and Jason at the Tent Embassy this morning, and I also extend that to all of those here in this place. I would like to acknowledge my First Nations colleagues in this chamber and in the House, my sister and Greens colleague Lydia Thorpe, Senators McCarthy, Dodson, Lambie and MPs Ken Wyatt and Linda Burney. It's a humble privilege to join an esteemed group of First Nations political leaders past and present who have paved the way for us to represent First Peoples in this country and their issues on this, in these political forums. It was the year 1994 when I first travelled here to Canberra as a 17-year-old fresh-faced young girl just out of school, visiting my mum who was working for the Commonwealth at the time. Whilst visiting the public gallery here, I read the Redfern speech from former Prime Minister Paul Keating. It was at that moment that I felt he understood 
the impact of mine and my family's story. One which is shared across many families and communities, etched in our past, but also in our present. In particular, when he said, we removed the babies and we smashed the traditional way of life. And as I reflected recently, this was a significant moment that sparked my interest in politics. But as I sat in the chair outside posing for a photo, I knew there were no black politicians here in this parliament since Neville Bonner as a Queensland senator in 1993, and it would be another five years in 1999 till Aidan Ridgway came here as a New South Wales senator. It is my dream to recreate this moment and like others for so many other First Nations and Australian children, boys and girls to spark their interest in participation in our political systems. Rather than the sorrow and discontent I hear in their voices when they talk about our current systems and our representation. One that I constantly hear that doesn't represent them or their future, particularly on climate action. I want every young person in this country to believe that regardless of your background, one day you could be standing here providing your first speech too, and that you have the right to belong in this system that should represent you and your issues. I pay my heartfelt gratitude to my party, the WA Greens, who took the step of making me the first First Nations woman from WA to the Senate. I thank the members for your confidence in me and your investment in our grassroots movement. Together, our vision is to continue this work of fighting for a future that prioritises our people and our planet. I join the Senate to follow the important and unforgettable legacy of my predecessor, Rachel Seawitt. Rachel's work, as many of you know and have commented on recently, over 16 years, her amazing drive, tenacity and leadership, working across all sides of this place in what we commit ourselves to do as part of our responsibilities. It's not my intention to replace her here in this place, but to continue with her same admirable dedication, passion and commitment to our work for the Australian people. And I sincerely thank you, Rachel. My message to my people in my wonderful home state of WA, it's my honour to be your senator and to represent your voices and issues of our diverse people, place and circumstance, which is our footprint, which is sometimes forgotten here in the federal parliament. When I think about the sheer ge geographical size of our state, it's easy to see why there are, we are one of the most isolated places in the world. When you travel the breadth of the state, which I have done in my lifetime, from Mirawong country in, near Kununurra to Wangatha country in the gold fields, across to Malgana country in Shark Bay and Minang country in Albany and everywhere in between, we share some amazing and spectacular places. My job will be to fight for our interests and our issues to be heard and considered and to make sure our diverseness and uniqueness is recognised and respected for its valuable contribution to our nation's political, cultural, economic and social priorities. Coupled with my vast experience, I come to this place through a journey shaped by opportunities, hard work and challenges. I come to this place not as a career politician, but as a First Nations woman who worked in the area of social policy for two decades at the federal and state government levels of this country. I've worked on the international stage as a delegate on behalf of this government and successive governments. I bring those learnings to this place coupled with my knowledge of people, country and our history to make a difference in all of our lives. As a recognised leader in the international community, Australia has been heavily criticised for its treatment of Indigenous peoples. And domestically, we see the ever increasing erosion of Indigenous rights, including the rights to country and culture, which impact on our daily lives. Under the cloak of economic and social development, we make laws and enact decisions in this country that destroy the fabric of social and cultural rights of our First Peoples, while at the same time asking them to extend a hand to reconcile a past, one that we are unable to escape in modern day Australia. This degree of marginalisation continues to perpetuate despair and hopelessness. This is not a new thing, and in fact, my Noongar grandparents had to apply for citizenship in this country, and not because they weren't from here, but because they needed to access rations to feed their children in the 1950s. All because this was government policy and they were classified and treated differently because of their race. A serious lack of political will by our successive governments to prioritise the implementation of its obligations as a signatory to the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People must change. 
We need action to go further than a debate or a conversation in this place. Remodelling and reshaping this important process to create models of governance must include the voices of First Nations people from our recognised political and cultural leaders to our grassroots people. The time to do this is now and requires nothing more than courage and leadership from all of us. Bipartisanship to ensure the next generation are able to participate and enjoy the shared future that recognises, respects and elevates the sovereignty of our First Peoples of Australia. The only way I see to do this is to join other Commonwealth countries in creating our own national treaty. We need truth-telling processes that pick up where the apology left off. To bring together our sovereign nations, complementing and enhancing state-based processes that enable us to drive localised change and to hear the important stories that clearly articulate the experiences of First People in the conversation. Co-producing a national framework on our national treaty to speak directly to the parliament, understanding two-way law and cultural practices that decolonise a system to truly benefit the people. A true national identity shaped and celebrated by every Australian and one that we can all be truly proud of. It's time for us in this place to create a shared vision, one that's grounded in hum humility and justice for our future generations and ratified through the internationally recognised treaty processes set by the global community. This work can and will bring reparative and restorative processes to our collective shared history and pro provide peace, healing and hope for our future Australian generations. My experience and knowledge has shaped my approach and pivots on the way I see and participate in the community. I have lived and worked in regional WA, and I can personally relate to the challenges we need to meet for our families and our communities that have different geographical and accessibility challenges. My hometown is Kojana in the great southern of Western Australia. My family have worked as shearers and farmhands over many generations. My yearn to be back on country includes reconnecting across those relationships and friendships that were forged by my ancestors when pastoral living shaped our economic survival and for many still does. My great-grandfather was an Irish cattle station owner at Dalgetty Downs in the Gascoigne region. This is my Yamaji connection. Before my grandfather was removed and taken to the Ninorsha mission in Ewart country. My family have survived five generations of the stolen generation regime in this country. I come from the first generation of children to be raised by, the parents, by their parents, and I am one of the lucky ones. On a recent regional trip to Yingara country in Carnarvon, I visited the statue of the Lock Hospital at the Three Mile Jetty. This story, like so many others of intergenerational trauma, still reverberates across our communities and our families who are, have been affected by these policies. WA is the leading state, and not for good reason, on the highest rate of child removal in this country. It is the reason I came to be interested and heavily invested in the legislation that governed my people's lives, and as these other things that we can change, and that they need better ta and tailored cultural and community-led responses. These new approaches should not continue to perpetuate institutionalised approaches. This is the collective blood memory of our convict-built nation, where some of our biggest investments in this country are still in police and prisons. Like many others, I continue through my resilience and resistance to a system which fails to see the intersectional issues needed for me, not just to survive, but to thrive. One by one, I have overcome them. But for some of my fellow Australians, this is not the case. Evidence through the unacceptable deaths across the justice system that sees First Nations people, particularly women, dying in preventable circumstances. There should be a full coronial inquest into these deaths, and I know multiple families who have called for those inquests. As a former police officer, my approach is couched as a reformist. Following the implementation of the Royal Commission on Deaths in Custody, I know that the script has been written, but the performance has stopped. These recommendations were framed and written for ATSIC as the self-determining framework, one that should have enabled a cohesive blueprint to self-manage and evaluate the outcomes of effective national implementation. But this is not the reality. It's 
Now it's just a watered down version of these national and state based commitments to improve the social determinants of health and wellbeing. Under the guise of closing the gap, we are prevented from dismantling the discourse that is the school to prison pipeline. Governments continue business as usual until there's a front page news story of a, de of a death in police custody. This should raise an eyebrow, but these days I'm not even sure if it makes a mention in the media summary to the relevant minister. But in First Nations communities across this country, it's a constant triggering and cold reminder that there is no political will at all levels and sides of this political divide to stop those preventable deaths. In my home city, Buraloo, Perth, 56 homeless people died in 2020, 44 to August this year, and one third of those are First Nations people. In this place, we know better and therefore we should do better to interrogate and improve these systems now. As a staunch black feminist, a single mother of two daughters and someone who has experienced poverty, I've lived in social housing during my lifetime. I'm a business owner who was disproportionately affected, particularly over the course of this global pandemic. I am a survivor and a campaigner of family violence and discrimination. In my two decades of work as an activist, consultant to successive governments and an advocate working in the gender equality space, we have to stop thinking of this as only a women's, a women's only issue, but a societal issue that disproportionately affects women and children. We have been tackling this issue all wrong and in a vacuum, constantly expecting women to be fixing this issue. Most of all, we've not made it safe for women to call out harassment and violence. In this place, it is our job to provide that safety as a first part of that solution. Identifying strategies and committing funding to address the drivers of violence to prevent this from happening to our children and our grandchildren. What we know is that social disadvantage increases the prevalence of violence against women, including state-sanctioned violence. Disproportionately affecting First Nations women and girls, we are 35 times more likely to experience violence and 10 times likely to experience death because of family violence. This is why I will campaign for a national inquiry into the missing and murdered First Nation Australian women, similar to the one of our First Nations Canadian brothers and sisters from across the Pacific, into our unacceptable rates of death of women. The red handprint and symbol that I wore on my mask yesterday into the chamber and today that I hold up is a symbol of the bloodied hand silencing the voices of those stories. This work must be a priority to inform the already committed separate plan national plan on violence against First Nations women. We must prioritise and expedite a range of responses that can transform societal and cultural norms that are at the heart of the primary prevention work. A larger investment is required in primary prevention. Having trauma-led on-country programs diverting away from the justice system will enable healing and recovery to occur. This is the foundation for change. My work in the United Nations and APEC forums have centred on removing barriers for women to participate in decision making and solutions. In many nations across the world, men are not absent from supporting and elevating women's voices. And in Indigenous communities, this is important and effective. Decolonising platforms from policy development, advocacy work and alliance building relationships, particularly in international, have been instrumental in building my understanding and to work alongside my colleagues for the sharing of black women's voices to be heard at decision-making tables. Social and climate justice are intrinsically linked issues. They define and maintain the social fabric of our societies. And this has been the byproduct of the colonial processes in this nation. As we move closer to the point of no return on climate, we need urgent action and leadership from all Australian governments and all sides of politics. The impacts and biodiversity loss are two of the most important challenges and risks for human societies. Here in this place, we have the opportunity to consider those cross-cutting issues, intersectorial policies and regulatory frameworks that have strong synergies to contribute to the transformative societal change that is needed to achieve ambitious goals for biodiversity, climate mitigation and a good quality of life. As a First Nations woman, 
Through my birthright, I was given the responsibility to protect and care for country. This is my mother earth. The political circumstance I was born into has been passed to me from my ancestors, which have been doing this for generations. Australian Indigenous knowledges are the ancient stories etched on rock art in caves, the song lines we use to navigate and travel across our trade routes of this land, while singing in language to vibrate the ancestral connections of people and place, linking us to the past, present and future. Indigenous knowledge and connection to country is linked to identity and is part of our ancestral ways of knowing and being. The protections of cultural heritage, both tangible and intangible, are fundamental parts of the human and cultural rights of First Nations people. And our live example of this is the Jukun Caves destruction. First Nations people, as the sovereign people, are the only ones who can tell us why, what, when and where this cultural connection and our sacred sites are. The cultural protocols of First Nations communities are built on reciprocity, and that means it's time for corporate Australia to step up and show public support to self-determination, leadership and the inherent rights of First Nations people. I am asking industry partners to publicly reject the current legislative framework that does not afford human rights of First Nations people. Work in true partnership with First Peoples to build good practice that ensures seamless and mutually beneficial outcomes. One that confirms, respects and honours the goodwill statements that came from the corporate sector post Jukun. As the Australian Greens portfolio holder of mining resources, trade, science, research and innovation, I am well positioned to take those conversations across regional Australia the business sector and communities, for us to reimagine a future that will accelerate our collective actions. I'm no stranger to the work of politics, from my work in international flora to advising and lobbying governments. In lots of instances, I was the lone First Nations voice in some of those delegations, and in some instances, the first Indigenous woman to break new ground, as I am today. If anyone is under the impression that I was there as a token, this was quickly changed as I always challenged myself to actively participate in the processes that informed and shaped my world differences, worldview differences and shared solutions grounded in my experiences. Breaking glass ceiling is, ceilings is only the first step and a challenge of going where others have not gone before. It is a great opportunity to learn and share your knowledge with others that are not operating in your circles. My passion for breaking new ground across the stereotypical understandings and norms signal that I might be the first, but I'm definitely not the last. My footprint in this place cast in history-making actions should provide motivation and hopefully restore some hope and inspiration for many as we work to fight for our future together. In paving the way, I hope the concept of if you build it, they will come enables us to see themselves here in this place. And in future generations, we see the parliaments of Australia transformed to truly represent our communities. Incorporating diversity that reflects, emulates our communities, intersectorial, sorry, intersectional lived experiences are as part of the, as, as sorry, I'll start again. Intersectional lived experiences are also as important as the dynamic red here to follow a visible script created by some hard markers in our fundamental business to help us check our own privilege, reminding us that with gratitude we undertake this work with consistent checking, reflection, inquiry and most of all deep listening to our constituents and the broader Australian public. My pledge is to ensure the people of Australia that my values are anchored in the betterment of our community's quality of life and for future generations of our children to have a healthy and thriving planet to live on. Fighting for that future belongs to all of us, one that benefits many, not just a few. If you feel unheard and unseen, and in my time working here, I want to work to make sure that we change and transform this place so that we can be better allies for you. Climate and social justice is the unfinished business that we must prioritise as elected leaders of this nation which is here in the place of the people, the Senate. I wish to finish in my great-grandmother's Wadjuri Yamaji language. Nyo nyo, 
Gradamana, Malga, Beerly, Melbourne, and Yinana. Together we stand strong and we rise up. Thank you. The president just said to just check the hearing. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> yes. I guess I won't be speaking on this committee report that I was. Uh...